The day I got out, the whole prison was locked down. I was so lucky because they were doing a move. They were moving everyone to dorms. All over America now, they're building these massive mega warehouses where they can just put prisoners in them, these big dorms. Because the private prison companies get thirty to forty thousand dollars per year per prisoner. It's big business. Some of these states in America are spending more on prisons now than they are on education. So fortunately, I dodged that, and um, we're all locked down. And some of my friends managed to get their cells and you know come and say they make excuses and come and say goodbye to me and all this stuff. And then I get sent to a federal prison because I'm getting deported. It's in the federal immigration. It's, it's me and, and about a thousand Mexicans because it's mostly the deported Mexicans. And um, I'm there for a couple of weeks, and then if, if any of you guys have seen the movie Connor, the next thing is they start putting me on Connor, going over Arizona and California on these prison planes where the movie was starring Nicolas Cage. All these federal marshals and they're over you and you're all chained together on the plane and you can't go to the bathroom or anything. Then they take I'm on these planes for like two days, dropping off and picking up Mexicans. Then they take me to Los Angeles um, County Jail. And this is the final stop now before they're going to put me on the plane. And um, you know, I'm getting more and more excited. I can't sleep or anything. I've not slept for a couple of days. And um, so they put me on the plane. They say, we're going to put you. It's a regular flight from um, LA to London. So we're they go, we're going to put you on first. You don't screw the passengers. We're going to take you up there and take your chains off. So they got to take me up the stairs. It's like an all English cabin crew. And I'm hearing the accents and I'm like, yeah, you know, getting all happy. And they're really nice people. I get on the plane. And one of the first things I did, because I'm a bit institutionalized, is all the people are getting on, smell the women's perfume and stuff like that. I put my hand up and asked a female cabin crew member permission for me to use the toilet. She's like, you don't have to ask permission, you know. I'm just so used to being told what I could and couldn't do in prison. So I was asking permission. So yeah, I had this institutionalized mindset. So then I'm on this plane and we're going back to London. And then my parents are there, my sister, my mum and my sister are crying at the airport. And the first thing they did was took me to an Indian food restaurant that hadn't eaten good food in so long. And I just totally picked out this Indian food restaurant. And um, my mum said, you know, I was on the dole living with my parents then. I've been with this here for my first year. And my mum said I was like a puppy dog, just following around the house waiting for instructions. Because that's, my mind was just readjusting to everything. And they go out with my friends and stuff, and it was just like, it was just really weird. My parents were calling me Souls and Neatson because I looked like the Russian writer, and I had this beard <laughs> and stuff, and I'd come out with all pale and you know, looking very serious. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was, it was a lot to get around mentally and to get back on my feet. But again, it was thanks to the support of so many wonderful people. My parents, first and foremost, um, the people who helped me with my writing. And also the guy who started me out in public speaking. Now this came about because when I was released to London that day that I just told you about, I did a couple of BBC interviews and a Harley Street drug counsellor called Tony McClellan, he heard one of those and he contacted the BBC. He'd heard me talking about living with the cockroaches and he said, I like you know, how this guy's telling what his, about his experience. I would like to hire him to go into schools and share his story with them as a cautionary tale to put them off drugs and crime. So I went and met him, and he offered me the job on the spot. Now my brain was so messed up still, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with doing it. I said, I, I, I'm not mentally prepared to get in front of a school audience and do this. So it was like, well, just whenever you're ready, Sean, you know, come and do this for me. It took about another year before I felt mentally ready enough to be able to get up in front of a school audience and do that. And the, fir the very first time I spoke at a school, I'd moved down south now because he said it would be better if you moved down south, there's more schools he deals with there. It was Bishop Stortford College and I got up, I think it was like year, maybe year nine or less, maybe year eight even, 13 year olds. I was so terrified, I couldn't even eat my breakfast. And then I paced, I couldn't even face them, I was so scared of them. I've, I've been living with these murderers and gang members and all this stuff, and I can't even face an audience of school children. I'm pacing like a prisoner in the cell at the front of the audience, unable to look at them. Just like, just talking and talking and talking. All this manic energy coming out of me. 
And I left there and I called my parents, you know, because this big thing is Sean able to get a job and work as a real person and do this. And I called my parents when I get out and I just told them, you know, I was so nervous, I just, you know, I just don't know what the hell happened. I don't think, you know, I'm cut out to do this. I just don't think it's going to work. And then, because I had no idea, you know, how they'd received me. Two weeks later, and this is a school that gets a, a, a proper public speaker in every week, it's like a private school. They said the kids had voted me the best talk of the year. Yes.